Welcome. My name is Pastor Chad Mills, and I'm glad that you joined us today for another lesson as we continue our study on Because We Are His series. Uh, lesson one was uh, Holiness Principles. Uh, lesson two was the Adornment Question, Part One. Lesson three was the Adornment Question, Part Three, or excuse me, Part Two. Uh, lesson four was the apparel question, part one. And today, we're going to look at part two, the apparel question. And uh, our next and final lesson, Lord willing, will be the hair question. And so we would, uh, Lord willing, do that in one total lesson. But before we get started today, uh, I, I, let us go to the Lord in prayer like we have no, our normal practice is. We want God to help us to soak us up like a sponge and allow the word of God to get rooted and grounded in our heart and our soul. God, I thank you for another opportunity. I don't want to take it for granted that we can open your word, look into it, rightly divide the word of truth that we might be saved. And God, I pray that we not only be hearers, but we be doers of the word, applying the word of the Lord to our heart that we might be saved. I pray, God, that we soak it up like a sponge. God, that we let it get into every corner of our heart and soul, mind and spirit, every avenue within our life, God. Let it be touched by the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to start with our key scripture that we used last week. It's going to be our key scripture uh, for this lesson, and it's simply this. Deuteronomy 22 and 5 said, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thou God. When we look at gender distinction in the Old Testament, it is very apparent that both men and women wore robes in Bible times. An obvious question that you may have and it's a question that I've been asked many times by different people is, how is it possible for them to fulfill God's command for gender distinct clothing? You see, historically, men and women have worn robes of one kind or another for a major part of history. Thus, the difference in masculine and feminine attire as far as its construction was concerned was in ornamentation. That is in their style, clothing, markings, lengths, cuts, and trims. These were obviously quite significant difference. Since knowing if you are a man or a woman could be very casually observed even at a distance. However, the most important gender distinction was not simply in what they wore, but rather in how they wore it. There were male and female ways of utilizing their clothing. Men and women clothes differ from one another. This is because there were laws that forbid men and women to exchange dress. There are many different sections of the ancient Hebrew dress. Some of these parts are the inner garment, uh, also known as the tunic or shirt. Then you had the outer tunic or robe, and then you had the girdle, then you had the outer garment or mantle, and then you had the headdress. The tunic was a shirt that was worn next to the skin. It was made out of leather, uh, hair cloth, wool, or lining. Both sexes wore tunics, but there was always a difference in the style and the pattern. For men, the tunic came down to the knees and was fastened at the waist by a girdle of leather or cloth. Female tunics were very similar to the males, but they went down to the ankles. There were and still are two different kinds of girdles. These girdles are normally either made out of leather, linen, or even sometimes silk. For the most part, girdles served as a pouch to keep money, or other things that an individual might need. It was also used to fasten a man's sword to his body. 
Hence, the girdle was a very important part of a man's attire. The outer garment, in the Hebrew, it's the kesush, it's K-E-S-U-T, also covered one while sleeping. And it was the final and most important part of one's wardrobe. The male and the female version of the outer garment were also similar, but were different in styles. There were also different types of outer garments. For example, women wore special outerwear when they were a widow. Outer garments went to right above the ankles or ended at the middle of the calf. The priests wore breeches under their robes in Bible times. This word does not uh, come up very often in Scripture, but in every case, when it does, it is always a man's apparel. Women were not allowed to wear breeches. According to the Hebrew lexicons, breeches means trousers that extend below the knees. And so from the word breeches is where we get our English word breeches from. Looking here at the slide on our screen behind me, um, I, I want to kind of break down a little bit here to kind of show you a little bit about, so linen breeches, uh, the Bible talks about these in Exodus 28, 42 through 43, uh, Leviticus 6 and 8 through 10, and then it, it talks about it in 28 and 42, from the loins even unto the thighs, and you can see here uh, on this picture here to the right right here is a uh, a picture, not the best quality, but I pulled it up. Uh, I put it from research here of what an old pair of breeches looked like. Who was to wear these? Well, the coat and the breeches were made for the priest. Also, and they were the ordinary garments of high priests and priests as distinguished from other garments, which were for glory and beauty. So, the tunic... When we begin to move forward with the tunic in the Hebrew, K-U-T-T-O-N-E-T, -T -T -E is a tunic, a inner garment next to the skin. Leviticus 16 and 4 talks about this. It was also worn by the women, 2 Samuel 13 and 18. It was generally with sleeves coming down to the knees and rarely to the ankles. And then we have... Uh, uh, th this came out of the uh, story in uh, Encyclopedia in the Genesis from page 420. In the Strong's, uh, it said that the tunic was from an unused root meaning to cover a tunic, an undergarment, a long shirt-like garment, usually of linen. And then in Wilson's Old Testament World Studies, it said that a tunic was worn next to to the skin, generally with sleeves, and then it usually went down to the knees, but seldom to the ankles. And we find it referenced there in Genesis 3 and 21. You said, Brother Mills, what about shorts? In, in much of Europe and America during the 19th century, and in early 20th century, shorts were worn as outerwear only by young boys until they reached a certain height or maturity. When young boys became older, uh, typically about around puberty, they would receive their first pair of long trousers. This produced the perception that shorts were only for young boys. And because of this, men would not wear shorts to avoid looking immature, even when the weather was hot. Women tended not to wear shorts in most cultures due to social morals. They tended, they were, excuse me, they were expected to wear dresses or skirts and blouses. In the 1890s, knee pants, a earlier type of short pants, became the standard wear for American boys. Many urban school portraits from the 1890s show all but the oldest boys wearing knee pants. 
North American boys normally wore knee pants with short stockings. This began to change around the 1900s when North American boys began wearing knickerbockers during the winters, while short pants became more popular in Europe. The 1930s, shorts started to be worn for casual comfort. Example, outdoor and athletic activities by both men and women. However, it was still taboo to wear shorts outside of certain activities. Since about the time of World War II, when many soldiers served in tropical locations, adult men have worn shorts more often, especially in summer weather, but the perception of shorts as being only for young boys took several decades to change and to some extent still exists in certain circles. By the late 20th century, it had become more common for men to wear shorts as casual wear in summer, but much less so in cooler seasons. So this kind of shows you a picture here going through there the little the knickerbockers uh, and, and going forth, going back there to give you a chance to see that. Forgot to change the slide earlier. Age of accountability. You say, well, Brother Mills, I, I get this question a lot. What is the age of accountability? Um, first of all, well, first of all, age of accountability actually only deals with salvation. And you say, well, what is that age? Well, it is not a particular age like we say at when you're at 10 years old, you have now become at the age of accountability. When you're at 13, when you're at 16, when you're at 18, you are now at the age of accountability. Understand this. And, and as an example, if you have more than one child, I was using this in a Bible study last night with somebody, that no two children are exactly alike. I remember hearing that when I only had one child and, and we, me and my wife, and we had, of course, children that were on, uh, a second child that was on the way. And I never understood what they, people would say about that until that second child come along. Their personalities are different. Their makeup is different. Their actions are different. How they respond. Uh, one is very, seemed to be very secure in life uh, and has a very strong self-confidence. The other one struggles with that. And so many things are different. So we know that men, uh, you boys and girls, mature at different levels. Most girls mature at a faster level than boys do. So it is... When it comes to accountability, it is not talking about age. It's talking about maturity. Uh, some, my daughter at five years old received the gift of the Holy Ghost. She had repented. She had been baptized. And at five years old, God miraculously filled her with the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. But. I do not even believe even then that she, just because God filled her with the Holy Ghost, that she was automatically at the age of accountability. Because even though she had the Holy Ghost, she did, even though she, we told her and we taught her, you need the Holy Ghost, she didn't know the ins and outs at that age of why the necessity was there. She just knew mom and daddy said, you need to have the Holy Ghost. And she wanted the Holy Ghost. She wanted to go to heaven, but she did not understand how that Holy Ghost would operate within her life. That did not come to later on. And so the children mature at different ages. When it comes to holiness, that's salvation that we've been talking about. But when it comes to holiness, we as parents have to train them up, okay? Proverbs uh, 22 and, and 6, I, I forgot to, to put it on a the slide there. Uh, on my on the screen, uh, but it said, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Uh, many uh, misquote that scripture or, or misinterpret that scripture to think that that means if I raise my child in church, they will never backslide, they'll never walk away from God, and then if, if that happens and they walk away from God, then you as an individual feel like a failure. If that's what you believe. But that's not what that, that scripture means. That scripture means it is, it is our obligation to train up a child in the way they should go. Your child does not know, okay, 
uh, what they should do and what they should not do. I remember hearing a, a comedian uh, years ago saying, if, if our parents did not teach us right and wrong, we would be like dogs out there chasing cars and biting tires, okay? So the child does not know, okay, right and wrong, so you have to teach that child. When that child gets to an age of adulthood, Okay, that child is no longer underneath your responsibility, no longer living with you under your roof. Okay, they may depart from what you taught them. Okay, they may depart as far as living the life that you told them. But what you taught them will never leave their heart. The same way spiritually, when we teach our children the word of God, when we teach them about holiness, when we teach them that here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, huh? when we teach them that they got to be born again of the water and the spirit, huh? and without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. When we teach them these things, they may stray from the fold down the road, and we pray they don't, but, if they, but when they get ready and God draws them back to him, they will know what real truth is and it, because it has not departed from their heart. Um, you know, you said, Brother Mills, what, what's the best age when we talk about young boys wearing shorts? I would say probably a good age is around kindergarten. They probably need to stop, uh, 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 you know, that's kind of a good benchmark, uh, you know, whatever. Or if they start asking questions before that. And me, remember, some mature a little quicker than others. Whichever comes first, okay? Uh, but that, there, that's a time to be transitioning there, that we're moving a little bit in growth right there. And we want to teach them uh, the right things. Young girls, um, as they grow, and believe me, they grow every year. Uh, uh, you get, you have to buy school clothes every year. Uh, things change. They grow. Uh, they're going to naturally need longer skirts, okay? Uh, many times young girls, uh, even ladies, will wear leggings uh, up underneath their skirts, okay? And, and that's okay. Leggings should not be worn, though, just so that they can wear their skirt shorter. But rather, it is almost like an extra layer that's going underneath, but the skirts still need to go to the proper length. The later English word, breeches, again, I mentioned it earlier, was developed from this term and of the word breeches, and it became our modern-day word as pants. Women in Bible times did not wear crotch garments or pants because of God's disapproval. Thus, pants were worn exclusively by men for the first 5,900 years of human history. It is only in the previous century that women's apparel has suddenly become impractical for women to wear. There may be some objections that someone would have in trying to argue a positive case for cross-dressing. Some point out that every time the word skirt is used in the King James Version, it always refers to a man. Their uneducated reasoning is that modern women can wear pants because Bible men wore skirts. However, the Hebrew word here for skirt in the Bible is kanap, K-A-N-A-P-H, actually means the extremity or the corner of a garment. When Saul in 1 Samuel 15 and 27, when he tore the skirt of Samuel's mantle and David cut off the skirt of Saul's robe in 1 Samuel 24 and 4, they did not rip their clothes off but they merely took a piece or a corner of their garment. Secondly, men in Bible times were permitted to gird up their loins while women were not. A man could transform his robe into a closer fitting, uh, less cumbersome garment by bringing the back hem 
of his robe between his legs and tucking it into his waistband. This would create a trouser-like effect, and it was a masculine appearance. Women were allowed to lift up the hem of their robe to carry something, but to raise it above their knees or to gird up their loins like a man was considered grossly immodest by God and by biblical society. When we look at Job 38 and 3, the Lord told Job, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. And then in 40 and 7 of Job, Gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. Understand that the girding of the loins was allowed in alignment with masculine robes and responsibilities. So we're seeing here uh, a slide that I've got on the screen, and it's talking about how to gird up your loins. Number one, the tunic wouldn't allow you to do heavy labor or to fight in battle, necessitating the girding of one's loins. Number two, they would host the tunic up so that all of the fabric is above your knees, and this would give you mobility. They would gather up all the extra material in front of you so that the back of the tunic is snug against your backside. Number four, once the excess fabric is gathered in front, pull it underneath between your legs to your rear. This feels much like a diaper. Number five, gather half of the material in each hand, bringing it back to the front. Number six, Finally, tie your two handfuls of material together and you are all set for both battle and some hard labor. Go forth, be you man, and gird up your loins. Notice that when God wanted Job to face him in a masculine posture of accountability, he commanded him twice to gird up his loins. How? Like a man. Job, excuse me, God associated Job's acceptance of manly responsibility with the state of his apparel. But that is perhaps not so remarkable when we consider the modern association of responsibility with the old question that many times uh, that people, you may have said it before or you may have heard somebody say it, who wears the pants in this family? Hallelujah. Peter used this analogy when he instructs Christians to gird up the loins of your mind. His ideal is for the mind to be so free from any burden that it's able to act very quickly, very decisively, just like a man, as I showed you on the slide, girded up his body. This phrase became a metaphor for being prepared, preparedness. Any garment that shows a separation of the leg above the knee is a modest apparel for a godly woman. God does not approve of it. An abomination unto the Lord. That came from our key scripture when it said Deuteronomy 22 and a 5. I want you to think just how serious is this ideal of gender distinction in apparel to God. It's very serious. Look at it. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. This verse is very plain in its condemnation of cross-dressing. But notice that the commands are different for men and women. A man must not put on a woman's garment. That is the feminine attire itself with its distinctive styling. That is enough of a command for him because adorning is not his particular problem area. However, the instruction are more strict for a woman because she is tempted more in this area. She is not to even wear that which pertaineth unto a man. So, for people say before, 
Uh, well, I'm not wearing men's pants. I am wearing women's pants. Well, let's look at that word, anything that pertaineth unto a man. Pertain means to relate, to have reference to, to be appropriate for, to belong to as an accessory, to the attribute, feature, or function. In the Latin root word, it simply means to reach towards. In other words, a woman must not allow her feminine apparel to reach towards or even slightly resemble a man's clothing or his masculine bearing. Hallelujah. The, the word abomination in its various forms uh, occurs over 40 times within the Bible. In general, its root meaning is something that is disgusting to God, that is filthy to God, that is very repulsive to God. While there were certain things that were merely an abomination to Israel under the ceremonial laws, other things were an abomination unto the Lord. Some would, uh, would attempt to discount the impact of Deuteronomy 22 and 5 and take the position that we do not need to obey it today because it is found in a chapter containing many other instructions to Israel which we do not apply to modern life in 2023. For example, the Jews were required to put a safety railing around the roof and to refrain from mixing different types of seed, uh, animals, and material together and to wear fringes on the corners of their garments. However, none of these were an abomination unto the Lord. Outside of the Ten Commandments, which were written by the finger of God and other moral laws, other moral laws, excuse me, are indicated in God's word by the phrase abomination unto the Lord. Malachi 3 and 6 lets us know that God never changes. So if it once was an abomination unto the Lord, it's always an abomination unto the Lord. Now, people would say, going back, I'm not wearing a man's garment, I'm wearing women's pants. Well, what then that simply means that I can wear a man's skirt then, okay? And if I walked in here uh, the next church service and I got a man's skirt on, first of all, I would hope that you would throw me out on my head and find you a new pastor. And uh, if not, at least leave and go find a place that's preaching the truth. But think about it. If it's okay for a woman to wear pants, it's okay for a man to wear a skirt. Well, Brother Mills, we're not worried about that. Well, it's the time that we're living in. I want you to look at the, on the screen behind me. These are pictures of 2000, and actually I put this together in 2022 uh, that I pulled off of right now. They do not say that these are women's skirts. They say that this is men's skirts, men's skirts. Commandments containing apparel. Um, let, let, let me go ahead and there, here's some more slides of that. So now let's move forward. There's an apostolic warning to us now in the New Testament. We've been talking about the old, gender distinction in the old, but now let's talk about the New Testament. Commandments concerning apparel are even more direct in the New Testament than in the Old Testament. There are two passages of Scripture that sum up these commands, 1 Timothy 2 and 8 through 15. I will therefore that man pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broaded hair or gold, our pearls are costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I've suffered not a woman to teach, nor to usher authority over a, the man, but to be in silence. Why? For Adam was first formed, then Eve, 
and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. 1 Peter 3 and 1 through 7, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation. Remember, we talked about that is the lifestyle of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of the platinum, the hair, of the wearing of gold, or of the putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And he continues on. Peter said, for after this matter in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as you do well and are not afraid with amazement. Likewise, you husband, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not Hindered. Notice that Paul's list of standards is basically identical to Peter's list of standards. Paul's teachings to Christian women is largely repeated by Peter, although in a different context. Well, the context of Paul's teaching is the conduct of women in the church. The context of Peter's teaching is the conduct of women in the home, especially where an unsaved husband is present. The striking similarities between the two teachings go to show that the principles of modesty and decency and outward appearance applies equally in the home as it does in the church house. We don't have two lifestyles that we we live and dress one way at church, and we do it another way at home. These were definitely areas of concern in the early church, for Christianity was born in the Roman world of luxury and moral decline. Since middle and upper class women did not receive higher education or work outside of the home or hold public offices at that time, they spent much of their time beautifying themselves in excessive dress and adornment. It was in this social context that apostolics were called to live their faith. It was not surprising to find many New Testament warnings to seek inner adorning rather than outward adorning. So Paul says that clothing must be modest or orderly. The word modest comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means well-ordered, becoming, dignified. It describes one whose self-discipline and, and humble attitude is reflected outwardly in appropriate attire. Paul was very smart enough to know that a woman's dress is a very mirror of her mind. What we said, so what do you mean, Brother Mills? What a woman wears not only reflects her morals, but it reflects her conduct and her demeanor. Paul goes on to say, talks about apparel. And in, in, when, when Paul is talking there in 1 Timothy, he, he said, uh, in like matters, let women adorn themselves in modest apparel. And when he's talking about this, the word apparel comes from the Greek word katastro, uh, which means a long flowing garment. This word reflects directly on a style of garment that the Greeks called the katastola, which was a loose fitting, flowing, and it covered from the neck to the knees, long. 
Notice that Paul requires the same type of garment that God required in Genesis chapter 3. The garment of a woman should therefore cover the thigh and the knee. It does not have to be longer than that. Uh, I, I try to teach as a benchmark here. It needs to cover the knees. That when, when a lady sits down, uh, she needs to. Her knees needs to be covered without her constantly needing to pull at her dress. Or if it's making you feel uncomfortable or you're constantly, then it's not long enough. But if you're able to sit down and be modest and your knees be covered, then your knees will be covered all the time. If Paul had wanted to specify an ankle-length garment, he would have used the Greek word, uh, P-O-D-E-R-E-S that is used in Revelations 1 and 13 when it talked about it going all the way to the ankle. You said, but Brother Mills, I have a conviction that I want to wear mine to the ankle. That is great. That is great, okay? I'm not, I would rather have somebody to go beyond the border, beyond the benchmark, than have somebody that always wants to say what well, as close as I can get to the line and still be saved. Pants are not a modest garment for a woman because even though they are past the knees, they're long, they are not a flowing garment. They also gird up the loins, separate the legs above the knees so that they are only appropriate for a man to wear. I, now, I, I want to be very clear on this, whether even if you're wearing your, a skirt, a dress, and it's to the floor, it is, if it is a tight garment, a tight garment of any type is not modest because it is not a flowing garment. If, if a lady's dress leaves no thought to the imagination, uh, uh, that that creates that lustful spirit uh, that portray it. Number one, it's showing what's going on on the inside. But we do not. That's why the Bible tells a man it's not good for a man to look upon uh, that that woman uh, uh, and, and have adultery in his heart because it begins to work within the heart. It begins to work there in his spirit. And then Paul moved forward, and, and when Paul is talking, he said. With, with shamefacedness and sobriety. Uh, so let, let's talk a little bit about the shamefacedness right there. What, what does that word mean? Well, it, it, it actually, another word in our English would be decent. But the word shamefacedness comes from the Greek word, A-I-D-O-S, which means a sense of shame, bashfulness, reverence, regard for others. It is derived from the root word, E-I-D-O, which has the significance of turning the eyes, the mind, the attention to anything. This word has a deeper significance in regards to adornment than it does to apparel. However, in the matter of clothing, this, this word tells us that a woman is responsible to dress so that she does not turn the eye, the mind, or the attention to the form of her body. The reason for dressing decently is similar to the reason for locking the house. You see, we lock our house to protect what is inside and to prevent intrusion from the outside. Clothing can invoke intimate and even passionate responses, which must be reserved for the marriage relationship only. The purpose of decency in dress is not primarily to hide ourselves from the views of others, but to preserve our intimacy for our spouse. Decency should be respected, even within the immediate family. For indecent exposure always destroys mutual respect. Various states of undress, uh, which are commonly accepted among family members, can cause children to become desensitized to nudity. There is a sense in which modesty is variable in this world. 
For example, what is biblically modest in public differs from what is biblically modest in the privacy of a married couple's bedroom. What may be modest between husband and wife can be immodest in the front of your children. What may be modest night clothes is immodest if exhibited in front of others. Uh, you may say, well, Brother Mills, talk to us about what it's okay on proper night clothes. Listen, I learned a long time ago, it is not my job and not my responsibility to tell anybody what they wear to bed in the privacy of their bedroom. That is between a husband and a spouse, or a husband and their wife, uh, vice versa, right there. That, 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 that's between them. I'm just going to be honest. If a pastor, I feel like, is dealing with those things, it, there's going to end up being some other issues and some other problems that happens down the road, and I don't want to be a part of that. Uh, you say, well, Brother Mills, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what about going swimming? Uh, what about those type of things? I believe that if a man or a woman, look, we don't break it down two different ways. I don't believe in mixed ba uh, bathing where, uh, as far as uh, if we're going swimming, those type of things, unless it is a spouse, a husband and wife, a, a couple of brothers out there, or I believe it's okay if it's all of the same sex. If it's all males, if it's all females, then they can wear the proper uh, bathing suits that they desire, okay? But I do not believe that we should be doing mixed bathing where uh, members of the opposite sex, unless it's husband and wife, are out there. And then that even needs to be in the privacy, a uh, privacy fence, you know, th those type of things. Uh, we don't want to let our good be evil spoken of. Uh, and you say, well, Brother Mills, I mean, I mean you mean we? it's okay to wear shorts and, and it's just uh, us and a bunch of guys and we got a, a, a privacy fence and, the, it's you know, it's just us and a secluded thing. You know, it's okay. It, you know, God can see us. Well, yes, he can also see us when we're in the shire. Okay, but we know why we're doing what we're doing, and we're doing it under the proper circumstances. Now, if you're an individual that says, I I'm a man, I feel like uh, I should even wear shorts, even if it's all of the same sex uh, there, uh, and I need to wear long pants, I encourage you to abide by your convictions. If it's me and my wife or me and a bunch of guys from the church and and, and we're at a, a, a secluded pool, or maybe at, at our house or somebody's house right there, and, and there's, there's no uh, members of the opposite sex that are present. I will wear uh, a, a pair of sw a swim trunks to swim in, okay? But if I'm going out and I'm at the ocean and I'm going to get out in the water and I'm at a public beach, I'm going to have my long pants on, okay? Uh, uh, because... Uh, I'm going to do what I feel like is right and pleasing unto God, not into this world. The modern day problem over modesty is not primarily the putting on of apparel, but rather in 2023, it's the taking off of apparel. People and unfortunately individuals have taken modesty that is confined to private settings and moved it to public display. Okay, when, when we think about um, the very things that people wear on a beach, on a public beach, the type of bathing suits that they wear, whether it be a one-piece, two-piece, whatever how you want to say it, they have basically taken their undergarments and put another name on it. And would they go to the mailbox? Would they go to the beach, would they go anywhere else in their undergarments? But just because they changed the name of it, they feel like it's okay. Well, just because we call sin a different name does not mean it's not still sin in God's eyes. I've had people to ask the question, Brother Mills, uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, when it comes to getting back to where, what you wear to bed, but maybe it's just your pajamas that you wear around the house. And, 
and, and, and a, a lady's wearing pajama pants and, and things like that. Is that okay? I do believe that that is okay personally if it's in the privacy of that home. But I don't believe if we, we could take that same outfit and say we're going to go to the dollar store here or even out in the yard. We're out in public and see that. So see what I'm talking about? We got to use balance. We got to use wisdom. But if you have a personal conviction against that and you say, I, sh I feel I should just wear a gown, uh, no kind of pajama pants or anything like that, if you're a woman, you need to abide by that conviction. When it talked about shamefacedness or shamefastness is another word, it is the godly internal moral quality of blushing when sin is viewed as repulsive. It is that modesty which is fast or rooted deeply in the character. If a woman desires to display her body to others, there's something wrong. It has been said that one can wear the most modest clothing and still be immodest. That is true. And it is the reason that Paul instructs that a woman's dress be a sense of decency. Then Paul moved on talking to Timothy, and he says in that the end of that, he said, uh, let me go back and find it. It's uh, where Paul said with shame and sobriety and sobriety. So when we're looking at, at that verse, breaking that down, another word for that would be restrained. The word sobriety comes from the Greek word, which means soundness of mind, sound judgment, curbs one's impulses, self-control, temperate. It signifies a habitual inner self-government with constant reins on all passions and desires which would hinder the temptation to these from arising. This also has a deeper significance in regards to adornment than to apparel. However, in the matter of clothing, this word speaks of the inner self-control that a Christian woman must exercise being constantly vigilant to resist the seduction of fashion. It speaks of her careful consideration to not only wear apparel that is modest, but also to restrain from apparel that purposely attracts attention to her. In Mark 7 and 20 through 23, the word of the Lord said, and he said, that which cometh out of the man that defileth the man from, for, from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from where from within and defile the man. The Christian woman will be constantly prompted by the Holy Ghost to realize that she is responsible to dress with restraint. A, car, a common argument that I hear goes like this. If a man lusts after my body, then that is his fault and not mine. However, let's look at what Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 28. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her have committed adultery with her already in his heart. The man who looks on a woman to lust, he commits adultery, but he does it with her in his his heart. Therefore she had a part in it by wearing clothing that either accentuated the outline of her body or showed portions of her body that only her husband should be allowed to see. The principle of inner restraint causes the Christian woman to use fashion without abusing it. It is not the designer's who are important to her, but rather it is her creator. It's not Hollywood. It's not Paris, France. It's not, it is her creator. It's important to note that while first century Christians could follow the general dress style of their culture, 
with only minor modification. I understand in 2023 that modern Christian women cannot follow today's popular dress standards due to the overall degeneration of society. Hallelujah. I'm married. I understand my wife would be the first to tell you it's hard being a Christian woman to find proper clothing in the time we live in. But I'm telling you, it is possible and God will honor you when you do it. Let's talk a little bit about a word in closing here to Christian men. There are more external standards, as we have discussed, in God's word for women than for men. However, the principles of modesty, decency, and restraint apply to Christian men as well. A modest male apparel may not be as much of a danger to most women as a modest female apparel is to men. However, there is still the danger of temptation to some women. As well as within our wicked society, there is additional danger with the rapid spread of homosexuality. Remember that Adam's ideal, a proper covering, was not God's ideal, a proper covering. Most of all, remember that God has more internal holiness commandments for men than women because men need to be godly men, even in their apparel. Let's talk about short sleeves. The key in here, I believe that short sleeves are okay. It's not the length of the sleeves that we're talking about. It is the modesty that we're talking about. See, your sleeves can go all the way uh, past your elbow, but they be so wide that when you lift up your arms, whether you're praising God or not, the individual can see all that are beside you, can see everything, can see your undergarments, can see it all, okay? You could have short sleeves that go above the elbow. They could be tighter fitted, still modest, but tighter fitted, and they don't even really move, okay? Modesty is the key. I, I'm, I'm not going to be a pastor that goes around with a tape measure. God did not call me to be a cop. He called me to teach his word, and he called the saints of God to obey the word. But on the platform, you will, uh, I, I have a platform standard that I do not uh, want uh, short sleeves on the platform because I believe it, 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 we take it, this platform is very holy. It, it, it's a very, uh, we want to go the extra mile. And so I don't want uh, an individual to walk on this platform and what they viewed as being modest, I might have been towing the line a little bit and they could have been very sincere but their sleeve may not be where it needed to be, and they be immodest. I was at a, I was at another church here a while back. I'm not being uh, trying to be uh, super spiritual or self righteous Pharisee, please, please. But a, a young girl was there, and, and it was at a sectional rally, and and dressed godly from the head to her toe, and she had on long sleeves. But when she would lift her hands in exuberation and worship that I sincerely believe she was given to God, you had to turn your head because you could see all the way down. You could see her undergarments. And, uh, and so you, you could see those type of things. And so what, what, what am I trying to say here is I sit there and watch uh, those that were in authority deal with that in the proper way without embarrassing somebody over there. But I don't want to have to go service after service and have to even worry about that, okay? We can go the extra mile. If we'll go dressed by uniform on the job, and if they tell us this is what you got to wear, uh, you know, then, you know, or, you know, even if you work at McDonald's, this is a uniform. If you go work for Uncle Sam, uh, you know, you're in the Army, the military, this is the uniform you're going to wear. Uh, my goodness. 
what can I not do for God? I refuse to do anything for man that I will not do for God. Hallelujah. And so in our final uh, consideration here, now going back, talking about short sleeves, if you have a conviction against short sleeves, honor your conviction. Honor that. That's what you should do, okay? But let's look at the final consideration. Men and women were created by God with different emotions, with different desires, with different physical makeups. God is decreed in his word that he wants us to maintain and celebrate these differences, even in the matter of outward apparel and adornment. And so when we, when we look at the order of creation, God is so serious. From the very beginning in maintaining this difference between men and women, that he calls it an abomination when we break down his standards. The matter of separation in dress, like most holiness standards, goes all the way back to that order of creation. And to rebel against your function and your role in creation is to rebel against God. One of the most effective ways that Satan works to advance the work of sin in society is to try to dilute. He will, dil he will dilute God try to, God's standard of dress so that others are tempted and God's order of creation is broken. There will always be a difference in gender because there has to be. But the sad thing is that now the emphasis is not on the beauty of a woman's, uh, uh, her feminine side or the strength of a man's masculine side, but merely on the difference of body parts. To only emphasize physical body differences can only lead to lust and, de and degrading of womanhood and manhood. The driving force behind the unisex fashion of our time is the feminist vision of a new genderless society where the clothes and the roles of men and women are, are interchangeable. Such a vision of a genderless society is clearly condemned in the Bible. God wants us to clothe ourselves in ways that affirm our gender identity and our roles. I'm going to show you some slides here. And uh, many people, uh, whether you've ever listened to our music or not, uh, when you was in the world, whatever, uh, have heard of the lady by the name Celine, uh, Celine Dion. And... Uh, she has, if you, when I put this together, first taught it a few years ago. I don't know if that website's still there or not. But I literally pulled this from her website. She's got a clothing line for kids, or at least she did, okay? And on that, her whole clothing line is genderless clothing. Uh, no genders uh, for that, for kids. And it says on it said it from her website, two forces by one voice. It says that fashion has the power to shape people's mind. And it says, inspire your children to be free, to find their own individualities through clothes. And it moves on. This is from her website. The dialogue between clothes and creativity and art amplifies the discussion about a humanistic education which is gender free strengthens the power of personality gives the spirit space to grow this is the education that fashion can instill based on the concepts of equality and respect for humankind this was on the website it says, instead of putting children's drawing on your refrigerator, on the fridge, why not push an ideal as far as it can go? Now, 
I want my children to think outside of the box. I want my children to believe that if they wanted to, they could be president one day. Uh, I want everybody's child to, I want everybody, regardless of their background, their culture, their race, uh, uh, anything, I want every generation to believe, just like my dad taught me, I want you to succeed further in life and go further in life than I ever dreamed of. But, <laughs> this is not what that is talking about. Push an ideal. It don't matter. It's like, let's build the tower of Babel. We don't need God. Let's get away from the things of God because more than I want my child to have a good education, more than I want my, my daughter is a, a career-oriented person, more than I want her uh, because I promise you she can do it as good as not better than any male in the things that she does in her job. More than I want that. I want to make sure are they sticking with the book and the word of God. This is from the website. But the course will always be there. There's to choose. We got blue on one side. We know that represents a, 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 a little boy, pink, little girl. It's saying let them choose what they want. We're, this was several years ago that I put this together. And look at the world that we're living in right now. We're, they're trying to tell our kindergartners and trying to tell them that you can be a girl if you really want to or you can be a male if you really want to. We won't let them go to war until they're 18. We won't let them vote until they're 18. We won't let them smoke cigarettes in the world until they're 18. We won't let them smoke alcohol until they're 21 in the world. But we want to tell them they can choose their own sex and get away from what God intended for them to be. We want to tell them that they can love someone of the same sex and that spirit of homosexuality when God created male and female created both he created them not he created male and male and female and female he told them to multiply and replenish the earth why is it I want you to think about this in the world that me and my wife were talking the other day why is it that two homosexuals whether they be male are female why is it that one always has to be the masculine one and one has to be the feminine one why won't the two women just both be feminine or the two males just both be male but one always plays the part of the male because there's a certain part they run I could never get away from what God created and that's what God do I hate the sinner no do I hate the homosexual? No. Do I hate the transgender? No. Do I hate the? No, I do not. I hate the sin. I don't condone the sin, but I love the sinner. And I'll be the first pastor that I get into an altar and will pray with them. I've done it before. I've done it before, and I'll do it again. What we're talking about right here is very satanic and a new world order of Satan trying his best to change what God created in the garden. Talk about the importance, this is, I said in closing, this is definitely in closing, of holiness and apparel. Since women do not generally look upon men, men do not look upon them, excuse me, as men look upon them, excuse me, Christian women sometimes may not think modesty is all that important. But it is for this very reason that they should pay particular attention to what churches teach about holiness in apparel. Otherwise, they can easily get caught up in the immodest lifestyle of the world. In the Garden of Eden, all the way through Israel's idolatry, apostate times, and even in recent history, you will find that women often lead in matters of sin. Although they are the weaker sex, they yield incredible power over man. You don't believe it? Men have went to war over one woman. Men have built castles 
for one woman. They also, though, have a very influential role in succeeding generations of affecting them and the influence through the role of motherhood. Their influence for evil or good is immeasurable. God has always desired his people to be a peculiar, a rare people. That is why he told the Jews to dress a certain way. God wants us as the church of the living God to be identifiable, not in a self-righteous attitude, but identifiable to this world in our apparel. Or what is your personal obedience as a saint of God? You might say, I'm not convicted about wearing pants, etc., makeup, jewelry, on and on and on. But your lack of conviction does not give you permission to ignore or rebel against the word of God. You've got to ask yourself, what is the final authority for how I live my life? Is it my feelings, my convictions, or is it the Bible, the word of the Lord? Human feelings are very deceptive, but the Holy Ghost will never leave you contrary to God's word. Some say that such apparel is okay because it's common, it's comfortable, it's convenient. But these concepts have absolutely nothing to do with biblical relationships with God. Persistence in immodesty has serious ramifications. Wearing immodest apparel in the face of biblical instruction demonstrates a willful lack of subjection to God and to the pastor that God has placed in your life. The attitude of many today is, how much do I have to do to be saved? The attitude of a Christian is, how much can I do to please my Savior? Not to please your pastor. We don't just need to do it to please the man of God. We need to do it to please him. If you live by that attitude, you will have no problem with holiness. No problem at all with holiness. I want to thank you. If you have questions about this, please feel free to reach out to me. Maybe I can help clarify something a little more. I, 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 I want to make sure that I'm presenting this in, in, a, in a good way that... Uh, People can relate to it. People can digest it. And, and, and so uh, all I ask you to do is just uh, take it. And if it's something that don't agree with your flesh, pray about it and see if it agrees with your spirit and allow God to talk to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Until next time, God bless you in Jesus' name.